So without any further delay, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Lonnie Johnson. Can everyone hear me okay? No more volume. No more volume. Okay. How's that? Good. Well, first off, I want to just start out by saying what an honor it is to be here. Um, I was sitting there waiting patiently on someone eventually, and, they, and uh, someone eventually did say the word Tuskegee. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I, I want everyone to relax and enjoy the, the presentation I'm going to present. I, 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 it's probably got a little bit more in it than I'm going to really be able to give do service to, but there was so much that I wanted to share with you, and I really wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. So some of this I'll go through real quickly. Some of it I might spend a little bit more time on. Hopefully. The, the bottom line is hopefully you won't get bored and you'll enjoy the things and, and, and take some things from what I have to say. Um, most people know that I in, invented the Super Circle Water Gun. Um, that was a project that uh, evolved out of a different project I was working on. I was trying to come up with a, a new, type of, new type of air conditioning system that would use water as a working fluid instead of Freon because Freon is bad for the environment. So I wanted to use something that was environmentally friendly. And uh, as I was experimenting with a jet pump that I'd made for this uh, new type of air conditioner, I was in my bathroom and I had this hose hooked up to the sink with the nozzle that I'd machined and I shot the stream of water across the bathroom. And I thought, boy, this would really make a neat water gun. And I said, the heck with all of this hard science stuff, I'm gonna go make a toy. <laughs> and <laughs> I was having so much trouble getting people interested in the scientific research that I wanted to do, and I was trying to get investors to support it. I figured I could get enough money from the toy that I could go off and do uh, my real science research, and it turned out that um, that indeed did happen. Um, go ahead. I, I think most people have seen enough of this stuff. Um, I am a graduate of Tuskegee. I do have over 100 patents. I did spend um, uh, the earlier part of my career working for NASA and the Air Force, working on outer planetary spacecraft. I have an invention on the Galileo and a number of other things. I uh, was fault protection engineer on the uh, Cassini mission. Uh, that uh, fault protection engineer means that you're the guy that's responsible for the spacecraft in the event of a fault or failure. You want to make sure that ET can call home for help. In the worst case scenario, the high gain antenna points, points toward Earth so we can start communicating with it too try and diagnose and solve the problem. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is the JTEC, which is an invention of mine that um, uh, uh, garnished me the um, uh, Breakthrough Award for Popular Mechanics magazine. It's a new type of engine, and I'll spend some time on that. Go ahead. Uh, over the years, we've done research. Uh, we started out, actually, as a um, solid-state battery company many years ago. Uh, I got I uh, found some technology that, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory that I thought would be the next generation in, solid, in, in battery technology, period. Um, and it was around the time that people were starting to get interested in, in, in lithium ion batteries, and I did some work on that as well. But I thought to myself, as a small research company, it wouldn't make much sense for me to get into an area where a lot of big players, well-established companies were working. So I decided to leapfrog the whole industry. I was going to work on the next generation beyond lithium ion, start doing some research, develop some intellectual property patents, and uh, wait on the industry to catch up. So that was the strategy, and that's basically how we've gotten to here. Uh, along the way here, though, um, we had some venture capital investments lined up, and everything was getting ready to launch, and we were going to go off and be a, um, a, a, a high-tech startup firm. And then the dot-com bust happened in 2001. Uh, we had the VC deal all put together, the due diligence was done, we, the contracts were all drafted. We were ready to sign. We were supposed to sign that Friday, the dot-com bust happened on that Monday. And it all unraveled. So I made a strategic decision at that point to focus on R&D. So from that point forward, I've been doing uh, research on energy technology. The JTEC, which is, stands for Johnson Thermoelectrochemical Converter, 
evolved during that period, the ceramic battery, which I'm going to talk about, and the lithium air battery technology. Over the years, we've had support from DARPA, the Air Force, Department of Energy. We even had a couple of years of congressional earmarks before they got uh, a bad rep. Um, let's go ahead. Let me start out by talking about the problem that we face in energy. People talk about global warming and there's been a debate back and forth, back and forth. Is it man-made? Is it real? Is it a real problem? Um, this chart I put, I actually um, included this chart in my presentation uh, some time back because it shows a very, very uh, clear picture. This, it goes back about a thousand years and what it tracks is the um, um, this level of CO2 in the environment um, from a, about 1,000 up to about the year 2000. And you can see things were relatively stable up until the 1800s when the Industrial Revolution started. And you see this hockey stick kind of increase. And of course, associated with that is an e increase in global temperature. We were relatively stable, and now things are starting to warm up. And People are now starting to get concerned about this because we're seeing all of these crazy weather, weather patterns and things are, when things start to heat up, kinetics begin to get a lot more uh, active and you start to see larger and larger transitions. So if, if global warming and if it's not man-made, then my com point here is that we need to remove the human element. If we're not doing it, then let's take that off the table and let's see if it's still go going on because this is a real problem. If, it, if the world continues to heat up, uh, things are going to continue to, to change. Uh, the other point to keep in mind is that, you know, the United States, we represent, th th this chart, by the way, the um, um, green represents a uh, percentage of uh, population. Uh, and you can see here, the U.S. is here. We're about 5% of the world's population. But yet, the red shows energy consumption. We consume about 25%, almost 25% of the world energy. Um, and we often comment about this and we beat ourselves up about it, but if you look down on the chart here, most of the developed countries, just about all of them, here's uh, Russia, Japan, they all consume more energy than percentage of population. It really is a reflection of standard of living. The challenge we face is that China, China and India where we have large uh, percentages of population uh, don't consume uh, uh, as much energy. So as those countries and even some of the third world countries start to evolve and start having their industrial revolution and start to increase their standard of living, they're going to be consuming more energy. Um, when that starts to happen, of course, we're going to see more CO2 in the atmosphere, more and more impact. And the other part of that that's, that we should be concerned about is the fact that, you know, we're already seeing a lot of competition for existing energy resources, particularly uh, fuel, fossil fuels. And as the world starts consuming more and more, that competition for those fuels is going to continue to increase, and we're going to find ourselves bickering over dwindling resources. And, of course, that leads to more conflict. Go ahead. Um, of course, this is, um, makes that point uh, very clearly. Uh, from 1970 to 70, uh, 1999, uh, the economic cost of oil was about $7 trillion. That didn't include uh, military, strategic, and political costs. So the co cost of conflict uh, was not included in that. Uh, we've had three major oil spikes since 73, um, and each one was followed by economic recession. And we just had another one that's not on this chart um, in 2008 time frame. Oil prices, you remember, they were up around $4 a gallon, and of course we went into a tailspin again uh, because resources are going into that area and not where we need it or into economic development. We've basically been shipping our wealth offshore to bring oil onshore, and um, so our, it's, it's had a dramatic impact on our economy. So um, the um, I think there's a chart that's missing here, I apologize. The, the um, technology that a lot of people are looking at as a contributor to a solution for some of this is battery technology. Uh, battery technology has been defined as the most important uh, technical, technological space or research area 
for the next 20 years. There are alliances being formed. Um, uh, Korea right now has about 33% uh, uh, of the lithium ion battery market. Um, the, um, we, this country actually put $160 million into a, uh, a Korean company called LG in order to uh, build factories in the United States for batteries. Um, we've spent, I think the Obama administration is at this point somewhere four or five billion dollars on battery research and battery technology. So there's a lot of resource sources going into this area. Um, go ahead to the next one. So one of the areas that we're looking at is lithium air batteries. Um, if you look at the lithium metal, um, lithium um, is right up there with gasoline. Uh, gasoline, I think, is about 12 to 13 thousand watt hours per kilogram. Lithium metal is about 11,000 watt hours per kilogram. Yet, when you make a battery, if you look at a lithium ion, a lithium polymer battery, the existing technology is around 180 watt hours per kilogram. So what, what we've undertaken is a um, program to unlock more of that energy that's available. So the ceramic battery technology would get us to about 6,000 watt hours per kilogram. The lithium air technology that we're developing will take us to about 2,000 watt hours per kilogram. This is the next generation, and this one is the generation beyond that. So we're working on the next two generations of, of battery technology. The way the um, uh, solid state battery works, um, basically, uh, instead of having uh, an active anode, we actually use lithium metal, and the electrolyte in the battery is actually glass. So as you discharge the battery, the lithium goes through the glass, reacts with the cathode, of course you release electrons as the ions get conducted through here. And in charging, of course, you um, conduct the um, uh, ions back through and plate the, replate the lithium as you put electrons into the cell. Uh, so a lot of the research that we uh, focused on has actually been the use of the uh, glass electrolyte, coating that onto active cathode material. Go ahead. Um, the lithium air cells, um, on the other hand, are a little bit different, uh, whereas the lithium ion cell have both an active cathode and active anode material inside the battery. The lithium air cell actually um, uh, uses oxygen from the ambient environment. In that sense, it's more like a fuel cell. Uh, the lithium metal is here. Lithium gets conducted across the electrolyte into the cathode, but you get oxygen coming into the cell where you react with the oxygen. And when you charge the cell, you conduct the lithium back across, plate it, and release the oxygen out. What enables this to work is actually having a glass electrolyte. Uh, envision, if you will, uh, a piece of lithium exposed to the ambient environment. Because it's lithium, it's very reactive. And um, in fact, if you had a piece of lithium, it would turn dark or black right before your eyes when you first bring it out into the ambient environment. It is that reactive. But by having a protective glass over it, it's protected from the ambient environment. So the key here is to have that glass conduct lithium ions through so the lithium can come through and react with the environment on the other side. And the electrons, of course, go through your, whatever your circuit or load is. Um, this is a much, uh, this technology offers a safer um, operating condition because if you're familiar with the um, problems that Boeing is having right now with their battery, uh, in this situation, uh, if you start to have the battery overheat or it starts to run away, you can actually close the valve, deny oxygen to it, and, and that would literally shut the battery down. Whereas in an existing battery, you, it's just, I compare it to a um, rocket engine, you've got fuel and oxidizer inside the same can, and once they start to react with each other, you can't go in there and separate them apart. Go ahead. Uh, so to place the technology into perspective in terms of what we're doing, this is a chart that, um, Daniel published uh, a few years back, back in 2007, and they talked about where the future of um, battery technology was going. They were talking about approaching 600 um, watt hours per liter. Uh, it turns out that they, this, uh, that level of energy density has not yet been achieved, in spite of where they felt they would be by this time. Go ahead. Similarly, when you look at the uh, energy density, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this should be specific energy, watt hours per, per, uh, per kilogram, 
Uh, they were projecting uh, 200 watt hours per kilogram. And again, uh, this was, these charts were put together a few years ago, and the technology has really not progressed beyond this. On the other hand, when you start looking at the uh, technology that we're developing, uh, you are literally off the scale. Um, we're talking about for the ceramic battery in the range of um, uh, 2,000 watt hours per liter and in the range of 700 watt hours per kilogram. And, on, and when you look at the uh, lithium air technology, which I believe is the next chart, go ahead one more. Um, we're in um, uh, the uh, 2,000 watt hours per, per liter uh, range. So literally the technologies that we're working on are way beyond what the state of the art uh, uh, can offer. And we actually do have batteries uh, working that are giving us uh, performance levels in this range. Uh, we've, um, the, the challenge for the ceramic battery is the glass electrolyte itself. Uh, it's not so much a challenge of getting the energy density, it's getting the glass to conduct fast enough that we can get the energy in and out at a reasonable rate. Um, the lithium air technology uh, is a little bit more challenging. It's not only having a glass barrier that it protects the lithium, but because of the way it's operating, you're operating on ambient oxygen, which is very reactive, um, you, the, the challenge there is getting an electrolyte that's stable so that when you charge and discharge the battery, you don't end up literally burning up the electrolyte, which is one of the challenges that we've, we've uh, been dealing with. Go ahead. The impact uh, is shown here in terms of um, what the technology eventually will be able to do. Um, what's shown here are the existing um, uh, battery technologies, if you will, lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, and lithium ion. And what's shown on this chart is for a given battery rate, weight, this is how far you could drive an electric vehicle. Assuming an electric vehicle is about a two-ton uh, vehicle or 1,750 pounds. Uh, car. Um, so as you try to increase the size of the battery to drive further distance, you get diminishing returns because literally you end up pushing around heavier and heavier battery. So what you really need is a game changer. So um, the lithium air technology literally can get you a um, thousand miles on a 400-pound a, a battery. You will be in that kind of range. So a uh, a 1,200-pound um, battery could literally allow you to drive across country from, the, from, one, from coast to coast. So that would be pretty exciting. Uh, it also turns out the cost of electricity is much, much lower than the cost of gasoline in terms of energy. So if you had such a battery, a uh, 220-pound uh, battery would give you about a 1,000-mile range, um, and it would only cost you about... Um, $15 to drive a thousand miles. That's very, very different from what it would cost you to drive that far in a, in a, in a normal automobile, gasoline-powered engine. This chart here shows uh, another interesting set of data. Um, I like this chart because it is so confusing, but yet so simple. <laughs> What's over here, um, we have all of the energy sources coming into the, to the United States so that the United States relies on. There's solar, there's nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal, natural gas, coal, biomass, and petroleum. And this is showing where those energy sources go. And so you got all the breakouts into what, what gets used. Uh, for the most part, coal goes in the electric power generation. Of course, all the nuclear goes in the electrical power generation. In, uh, generation. Solar is here, some solar goes into residential and so forth and so on. So what you have is power generation, this is utilities, this is residential, this is commercial application, industrial, and here's transportation, which of course is where most of petroleum goes. But the net results is over here. Of all the energy available in the sources as they flow across, about 42% of that energy actually does useful work. 57% uh, of it is rejected as waste heat. Uh, and I think those people in mechanical engineering who know a little bit about thermodynamics will appreciate that. Um, so what would really be neat, neat would be to have an engine that operates more efficiently. Go to the next chart. When you think about engines, uh, they're generally mechanical devices, and I like to describe engines in terms of how they work. 
you compress a working fluid at low temperature, you heat it up and expand it at high temperature. And you get a lot more work out of the high temperature expansion than it does to do the low temperature compression. That, that applies to any engine. Your automobile engine, for example, you pull air in at ambient temperature and you compress it. But then you inject the fuel, heat it up, it gets hot, and it pushes the piston down, you get the high temperature expansion. Uh, steam power plants, you pump the water to high pressure, send it to the, through the uh, boiler where you heat it, convert it to steam, and expand that th steam through the um, turbine, and that turns the turbine to generate power. So it's low temperature compression, high temperature expansion. And they're generally mechanical devices. Go ahead. Um, one of the other things that we're taught in uh, uh, thermodynamics is that the ideal uh, cycle for doing work or converting heat to work, rather, is the, uh, what's called the Connaught cycle. And it's generally expressed as a rectangle in uh, temperature entropy space. Um, and it's characterized by a constant temperature expansion and constant temperature ex compression. Um, when you look at what the potential is, if you could build an ideal Connaught cycle, the uh, impact could be pretty dramatic. Um, internal combustion engines operate way off the chart, 2600 degrees centigrade in that range is where you burn the fuel. But yet the efficiency you get is something in the range of uh, 30%. If I had a Connaught engine and I, I'm operating on a heat source at about 200 degrees, and if I could dump it ideally at 30 degrees, uh, I could get close to 40% efficiency. So the Kano cycle offers you a lot more energy converted than uh, an alternative cycle such as Rankine, Auto Cycle, or, or, or one of the others. Um, go to the next chart. So I started looking at this. Um, one of the characteristics is say, uh, this constant temperature expansion, constant temperature compression process, and I thought, that, you know, one of the problems is that as the gas is expanding, you really can't get the heat transfer to it effectively enough to keep the temperature constant. So how could one do that? Well, I looked at fuel cells. In a fuel cell, you have a membrane electrode assembly, and the way it works is that you have hydrogen on one side, and the hydrogen, uh, as it goes through the membrane electrode assembly, it releases an electron, which gives you a current, and the proton goes through the membrane, reacts with water on the other side, I'm sorry, reacts with oxygen on the other side to give you water. Well, in this system, there's no oxygen and no water. You have high pressure hydrogen on one side and low pressure hydrogen on the other side, and the pressure differential forces the hydrogen through, gives you the current, and on the other side, you just reconstitute the hydrogen molecule. The voltage for a cell like this is called a hydrogen concentration cell. It's actually given by the um, Nernst equation, which, and it's a linear function of temperature and a log function of uh, pressure ratio. So what I plotted here are several pressure ratios going from a ratio of 10 up to a, a ratio of a million. That's a ratio, so don't think about a million PSI because that's unrealistic. But if I have 100 PSI on the high side and 10 to the minus 4 on the low side, that's a ratio of a million. So if I look at this chart and I took a ratio, for example, of 10,000, um, if I'm sitting at about um, uh, 500 degrees Kelvin, I'd have about 200 millivolts out of the cell. But at the same time, for that same pressure ratio, if I was at room temperature, I'd only have about 120 millivolts. So at low temperature, I got low voltage, high temperature, I got high voltage. And that was the uh, genesis of the JTAG. Go ahead. Um, the idea is that you know, when you um, change the temperature, you can actually change the voltage for a given pressure ratio. One of the early experiments that we did was um, this experiment here, where we actually had a gas cylinder that was 1% hydrogen and the other cylinder had 100% um, hydrogen. And as we, even though the total pressure of the two on, on both sides of the membrane electrode assembly was the same, the partial pressure of the hydrogen actually gave rise to the <coughs> nurse voltage and the data was right on top of the theoretical curves. The fuzziness is actually the data because we took a lot of little data points as, the, as we moved uh, uh, up, up the curve here in terms of increasing the pressure ratio. Go ahead. So we took that idea and we actually did build a steam engine where we had the um, water, we were boiling water, heating the water, coming, coming along one side of the membrane electrode assembly which created a low partial pressure of hydrogen and as that came through we condensed the water out and sent the hydrogen back to the other side. That partial pressure difference where we had pure hydrogen versus low 
uh, concentration of hydrogen actually gave us voltage and there was a solid state uh, steam engine. Go ahead. So that gave it, click it again. Yeah, that gave rise to what I call the electric heat pipe. Some of you may be familiar with what a heat pipe is. It's um, they use um, for heat temperature control in a lot of applications. It was actually developed in the, uh, by NASA for the space program for controlling the temperature of spacecraft. But they're also used in most laptop computers and, and, and a lot of electronics to remove heat from the microprocessor and dissipate it uh, so the processor doesn't overheat. But those are passive devices. They're better, they're, they're more uh, conductive in terms of just taking the heat from one location to another. This device actually can operate as an active cooling system, i.e. we apply power to it and we can drive one to end cold and the other to end goes hot. So we can actually use it for refrigeration. It's also reversible. You can actually use it as a, um, as a heat engine. We are ju just finished a um, DOE project, Space One SBIR on this, where we actually worked with Georgia Tech to do detailed modeling analysis. And we came up with uh, uh, performance numbers that were more than twice what you could get from a conventional mechanical heat pump. The way this works is that uh, you're, you're pumping hydrogen down the center tube, and this hydrogen comes down to the end, creating a low uh, partial pressure for water vapor. The water evaporates into this, and you get the combination coming down to the other end. When you pull the hydrogen out at this end, the um, concentration of water vapor goes up, causing it to condense, and so you deposit your latent heat of uh, condensation at the high temperature end. So you literally have a solid state device that when you apply power to it, one end gets cold, the other end gets hot. This is um, a patented invention of mine. Go ahead to the next one. So we decided to go a step further. So you know, one of the things that we're taught in thermodynamics, I think the second law says that you can't have an engine operate or do work without having a, two, a heat source and a heat sink. So that means that I can't have something sitting in this room that operates on heat from the environment and does work. Um, because you, you, it, that would be like perpetual motion. Uh, we don't um, violate the second law here, but we do sidestep it a little bit. The um, way this works is that we have two metal hydride beds, and the same, the membrane electrode assembly is sitting here. The idea here is that, yeah, you, you, in, in an ambient environment, you don't have a heat sink and a heat source, but then, yes, you do. They just don't occur at the same time. So the idea is that you thermally stabilize one metal hydride bed. By the way, metal hydride beds will store hydrogen at a certain pressure, and that pressure depends on the temperature of the bed. So if I thermally stabilize one, it's going to store hydrogen at a certain pressure. The other one, it's storing hydrogen at a pressure that depends on what the ambient temperature is. So as the ambient temperature goes up, this pressure goes up, causes hydrogen to go through the membrane electrode assembly, generate power, and get absorbed in this bed. When the temperature drops, the hydrogen goes the other way. So this rock and chair effect as you go through temperature transients actually cause the generation of power. So here's the test data where this was the thermal stabilized bed. We were going to take this thing outside and let it sit overnight and watch the transit and see what happens. But it turned out that um, the air conditioner cycling on and off in the room in the laboratory caused the thing to generate power. And that power was actually applied across a one-ohm load, so this is the voltage curve you get here. So it was a really intriguing experiment. Go ahead. Um, so we came up with the next generation beyond that, um, and this is basically where we are now and what we're working on is a, 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 a solid-state heat engine where you don't need to isolate the two metal hydride beds. You use different material. So one stores it at high temperature, at high pressure, I'm sorry, and the other one stores it at low pressure. So when the temperature is high, and you look at the Nernst equation, when the temperature is high, the voltage is up, right? So uh, you let the hydrogen go from the high, temperature, high pressure bed to the low pressure bed, and in the process, you generate output current or power. Well, when the temperature goes down or the temperature is low, you sense that, and you say, okay, the voltage is low. It's going to take less power to pump the hydrogen back. So you pump the hydrogen back from the low pressure bed to the high pressure bed at low at low temperature, low voltage, so it takes less energy to do that. The difference in energy is stored in the battery. Go ahead. So this is the ultimate 
I want to click, click again. This is the ultimate engine. Um, this is called a JTAG. And remember my description of how engines work, compressing a gas at low temperature and heating it up and expanding it at high temperature? Well, we use two membrane electrode assembly, assemblies back to back. This one was supplying power to it, and that's driving the hydrogen from low pressure to high pressure. So this is the low temperature compression process. Then this high pressure hydrogen goes over here and gets hot in the process, and over here where it's hot, you're expanding it at high temperature. Uh, so you got the high, low temperature compression, high temperature expansion. This is generating uh, current at a high voltage. This is consuming current at a low voltage. The difference in voltage is what ends up being applied to the external load. So this is a heat engine that uh, has no mechanical moving parts. It operates on the Ericsson ther thermodynamic cycle, which is a theoretical cycle that's equivalent to Carnot. So to the extent that I can reduce friction, I can approach a more ideal energy conversion efficiency. So the engine has applications um, just about anywhere you use a, a conventional engine. Um, I'm showing some conventional applications here. Um, the batteries, uh, I, I like to think in terms of energy storage for green energy because most green energy sources, solar and wind in particular, are not continuous power sources. You know, you're not getting um, energy if the wind's not blowing or if the sun's not out. So you need a battery to store energy when the sun's out so that when the sun's not out, you can have that energy to use. So you need a good battery technology and you need a good energy conversion technology. And it turns out that the JTEC is, uh, offers a um, higher efficiency than you can get um, from uh, solar energy converters. Go ahead. So this is basically what we're about, um, uh, a green energy source relying on uh, renewable energy sources such as solar and being able to produce the power very efficiently and of course a very efficient battery system so that we can actually use the energy once we store it for transportation or any other application. Go ahead. Um, that's pretty much what I want to share with you. The, the main point here is that um, uh, a good bit of the world is still in the dark. You can see here that the U.S. is very well lit, Europe is lit, but there are great parts of the world that uh, has not yet turned on the lights. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>